Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Doing it a little bit early because I'm going to be busy part of the night and I am extremely tired so I'm probably going to fall asleep early. Hopefully. Unless something drastic happens. Um, I have my laptop back. Uh, the guy called me last night and I picked it up. I'm starting to get everything set up now. You may have noticed I've already answered uh, some comments. You know, I'm trying to keep up with everything and catch up with everything so if I miss one uh, please don't be upset. It's just because there's so much to get caught back up on, and that's what I'm working on now. And I got to re-upload all my programs, video recording, eSword, and all that, which I'm doing eSword right now. I get that set up. And my uh, buddy actually bought me another computer, so I'm going to be working on that, getting that set up too, making that my primary use. And I'm going to turn the laptop into a, for a secondary use. And like, if I need to come into the other room and do a video. I can do that. That way I can open the scriptures up more and do it on my laptop without being disturbed. So, <sighs> Lots to do and a lot happened. I literally just got home like 30 minutes ago. Okay, so tonight we're going to be reading out of Job 13.23. How many are my iniquities and sins? Let's go here. How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Now this is really interesting because... Why would he want to know about these things? Why would he want to know and understand about these things? What would be, you know, the advantage with knowing what my transgressions and, transgressions and my sins are? Well, obviously, if you know what they are, you know what to avoid. <laughs> if you know what they are, you understand why, maybe why you're feeling guilty. Sorry, I want to go in here and get something to drink. My throat is dry. You might understand better, you know, why you're feeling the way you do. Ooh, I'm gonna have a fresca. All right. You might under it may help you understand why some things have been going wrong, haven't been working out right, why you haven't been able to achieve more, or gain more, or anything like that. It may even help you understand why, maybe why you're struggling. There's other reasons to want to know these things too, and Job's gonna tell us that. Go up five. One, two, three, four, five. Verse 18. See now, I have prepared my case. I know that I shall be vindicated. Who is he who will contend with me? If now I hold my tongue, I perish. Only two things do not do to me. Then I will not hide myself from you. Withdraw your hand far from me, and let not the dread of you make me afraid. Then call, and I will answer. Or let me speak. Then you respond to me. How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? Will you frighten a leaf driven to and fro? And will you pursue dry stubble? For you write better things against me. Sorry, for you write bitter things against me. And make me inherit the iniquities of my youth. You put my feet in the stocks and watch closely all my paths. You set a limit for the soles of my feet. Man decays like a rotten thing, like a garment that is moth-eaten. So he, he's feeling put upon. But he's pleading with the Lord. Tell me what I've done wrong. Not only will that help me understand what's happening and why this is happening. Of course, you know what's going on with Job. Everybody knows the story about Job and what was happening to him. This will help me understand what's happening. This will also help me understand where maybe I need to make some changes. Not where I need to avoid. Things I need to avoid. Our devotion goes like this. Have you ever really weighed and considered how great the sin of God's people is? Think how heinous is your own transgression, and you will find that not only does a sin here and there tower up like an alp, but that your iniquities are heaped upon each other, as in the old fable of the giants who piled Pelion upon Asa, mountain upon mountain. What an aggregate of sin there is in the life of one of the most sanctified of God's children. Let me read that again. Listen close. What an aggregate of sin there is in the life of one of the most sanctified of God's children. See, the natural inclination in your process of sanctification is at some point, and every, it happens to almost everybody, I, I believe everybody, at some point you start to see yourself as being 
exceptionally holy, exceptionally good. Oh, God is really paying attention to me because he starts to pour those blessings out and you're like, ah, I'm in great favor with the Lord. And then you start to get a little bit cocky and you start to stretch out where you shouldn't be. You start to extend your hand out where you shouldn't be. You know, the, the parent is really nice to the child. The child thinks, hmm, no, it won't hurt if I just reach out and take a cookie if I want. They're really nice and easy going. It's one of the first sins a child learns is manipulation and deception. Then they get that hand smacked. Then they look at you in horror. What? What did you do? Why did you do that? Then the tears come and they try to make you feel bad about yourself. I've raised two kids and I've helped raise dozens of others. I know I know this trick. It's an old trick. Of course we have sin. Anybody that says any different is lying to themselves and others. Peter says that quite clearly. If we say we have sin, we lie to ourselves. John says this. Paul says this. Of course we have sin. Why would we want to make that worse? Why would we want to, want to multiply it? Some of the problem is we don't know what sin is. We don't know what iniquity is. We haven't identified it. This is one of the biggest issues that we have, and people won't sit down and do it, partly because they don't want to offend anybody, but also because most people just don't know. That's a teaching that's been lost to time. What is sin? What qualifies as sin? And this is where we go back to the Word and look and see what, what did Jesus say was a sin? Well, adultery is a sin, yep, but Jesus said, you even think about it, and you've done it. This helps you understand more about the law. Me and my father were having a talk about this today when I was driving into his appointment. People will tell you, if you think you're going to follow the Ten Commandments, if you're going to attempt to follow the Ten Commandments, you're teaching works and you're teaching legalism. Okay? But the Lord says keep the commandments. Yeah, but you can't. I know I can't. That's the difference. I know I can't do it, yet my desire is to. See, there's a physical fulfillment and there's a spiritual fulfillment. What I can't do in my flesh, I do in my heart. That's what he's looking for. So though I know I can't fulfill the Ten Commandments in my flesh, nobody can. The only, only one person in human history has ever done it or will ever do it, and that's Jesus Christ. But my desire is to do it. My desire is to live under the perfect law of God, even though I know I can't. So what's my recourse here, even though I know I can't? I strive to enter the narrow gate. I find things in me and change. I identify the sin that's in me and change it if I can. And if I can't, I take it to the Lord. Even if I can, I take it to the Lord anyway. Lord, I have this sin. I don't know what to do about this. And sometimes, like he told Paul, my grace is sufficient. You don't need anything else. Don't worry. My grace is sufficient. Sometimes, lives are changed. It's all up to what God's doing. It's all up to his mercy and grace. There are going to be people who are going to step across the threshold from into the rapture and get a new body stuck in things they can't get out of. Does that mean they're condemned? No. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, no matter how much sin they perform, no matter how much iniquity they perform. But the desire after being saved should be to find those things, identify those things, find things that are tempting you and get rid of the temptation. That makes it easier to conquer the sin and overcome it's Overcomers strive to enter. It's very simple. But you got to understand it. What constitutes a sin? What constitutes iniquity? And am I, like the Bible says, a practicer of iniquity? Practicers of iniquity don't enter into heaven. Am I a practicer of this? What does it mean to practice? When you start to identify these things, you start to realize, huh, okay, well that makes sense, and that matches what the scripture says. So like this statement says, what an aggregate of sin, what an amount of sin there is in the life of one of God's most, one of most of the most sanctified of God's children. Absolutely. And people fight this. Fight this tooth and nail. I was sinless. My favorite statement told me in 2019, I was sinless six out of seven days last week. Well, congratulations. It did you no good. Attempt to multiply this, the sin of one only by the multitude of the redeemed, a number which no man can number, and you will have some conception of the great mass of the guilt of the people for whom Jesus shed his blood. That guilt is very key. See, before you're saved, you don't have that guilt. After you're saved, you do have that guilt. Because now you know what sin is. 
But we arrive at a more adequate idea of the magnitude of sin by the greatness of the remedy provided. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's only and well-beloved Son. God's Son. Angels cast their crowns before him. All the choral symphonies of heaven surround his glorious throne. God over all, blessed forever, amen. And yet, he takes upon himself the form of a servant, and is scourged and pierced, bruised and torn, and at last slain, since nothing but the blood of the incarnate Son of God could make atonement for our offenses. No human mind can adequately estimate the infinite value of the divine sacrifice. For great as is the sin of God's people, the atonement which takes it away is immeasurably greater. Jesus didn't do just enough. He did more than enough. And fun fact, nobody killed Jesus. Nobody killed Jesus. He died on the cross. They didn't kill him up there. People talk about, oh, they were murderers. They didn't kill him. What did he say? They don't take my life. I give my life. They didn't kill him. He gave himself. Anybody, you ever hear anybody say that? Well, the Jews killed Jesus. No, nobody killed Jesus. He gave his life. He gave it up himself. There was nobody messing with him or touching him. He died on his own at his choosing on the cross. Because see, he should have lasted as long as the other two guys and he didn't. That's why they pierced him in the side. They're like, we don't need to break this guy's legs. See, they would break their legs to make him die faster. He was already gone, and nobody realized it. Well, a couple of people did. But nobody realized it. Nobody killed Jesus. He gave his life. That's authority. And what he did by doing that, make what he did, his atonement, immeasurably greater than any level of sin in any one person or the whole. Keep in mind, he didn't die for one person's sin. He died for all persons' sins. Therefore, the believer, even when sin rolls like a black flood and the remembrance of past is bitter, can yet stand before the blazing throne of the great and holy God and cry, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather than hath that hath risen again. While the recollection of his sin fills him with shame and sorrow, he at the same time makes it a foil to show the brightness of mercy Guilt in the, is the dark night in which the fair star of divine love shines with serene splendor. In the guilt of your sin, now that you're aware of it, your salvation has changed your mind. You're now aware of things you never were aware of before. You now have questions about things you never had questions before. You, are now, you now see things you never saw before. You have a conviction now that you never had before over the same things you used to do that you had no problem with and saw no problem with. Now you do. That's the difference between being born again and not born again. The blessing of Jesus Christ becomes all the more greater and has all the more meaning because you're now aware of what he has paid for for you. You are now aware of the debt you owed and the, the level of the debt that you owed and the level that he paid for it. Whatever debt you owe, he paid for it multiple times over. Because it wasn't just enough, he was, it was more than enough. He is more than enough. And this is why we rejoice, this is why we praise him, this is why we glorify him. Because who can say they've stood next to Christ? Nobody he stands alone, and while we feel a bit sad when he says, I, I looked for someone to help and found no one, I stood alone in the slaughter. I, I stood alone in the judgment seat. We should rejoice that there was someone to stand and that it was him, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect deliverer, the perfect high priest, the perfect Lord, the perfect Messiah, the perfect Savior. None other could have even come close to measuring up. It had to be him. And I thank God that it was him. i become more thankful for that sacrifice than I could ever imagine. Realizing just how much was done for me, but for everyone else. And how much is still going to be done. It's not over yet. Doesn't end at the rapture either. Listen. 
The thousand year millennial reign, that's just a Kickstarter. Eternity doesn't begin until after that. There's still a lot that has to happen. But this is why we read. This is why we fellowship. This is why we talk with each other and wrestle these things out. Because the realization starts to hit you. Wait a minute. What did he... I now realize what he has paid for me. And a person that who much was forgiven has much to give thanks for. And that grows faith. That grows trust, because if he was willing to do that for me, I have to trust him. I have no choice. Even if I didn't want to, I couldn't. I have to. I cannot control it. I have to trust him. Because he did something for me that nobody else would do or could do. That's why I love him more than everyone else. He has done something I never thought, and nobody else ever thought, was possible what was told about from the beginning of all things. He saved the world when they were unsavable and unworthy of being saved. How amazing. How incredible. But that's our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's coming for us. All those that he's paid for, he's coming for us. What a glorious day we have to look forward to. What a wonderful, wonderful insight and hope to look forward to. We all have that. More than anything else in the world, we have that. And that is the most important thing. Because when everybody else is freaking out, when death is at the door knocking, we're sitting there smiling. Why are you smiling? What do you have to be happy about? We're all about to die. What do you mean by death? We're all going to die. None of us are going to be alive. I don't know about you, but I, I have a new birth. I've been reborn. I'm alive in a different way. And if my life is taken here, it will start in another place and be way more glorious than this. I, I, I don't have to fear those things. I don't have to be fearful of those things. That's the crossing over. And coming into the full realization of all of these things. And each one of us gets that day. Each one of us. And we look forward to it. When we get to see him. And thank him. In person. Lord, thank you for paying the debt I owe. Thank you for dying for me. I still can't wrap my head around it, but thank you. It's the greatest gift anybody could ever give. I love you all. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next video.